scene, everyone. We are the Jazz Bombs. Here's Felipe. One more solo video is a solo project that I've been working, and I'd like to share with you guys some of my thoughts, some of my findings, which has been very cool. But first, like and subscribe to the channel. It's very important to us. We're really thrilled and happy that uh, we broke the thousand subscriber barrier, which is really cool. Without your support, we, we feel like no no need to, to be doing what we do. And having some fun talking about records, talking about music. And today, I'm starting a series. Um, I've been taking some time to, to really think and research and share with you guys some of the school findings that we have uh, about Lee Morgan. I chose Lee Morgan uh, for his importance. I mean, he's been in so many sessions. He had such a tragic life in a sense, very prolific, very fast, very intense, uh, ups and downs his career, uh, his short living career. He died uh, very young. He was born in 1938, July 10, in Philadelphia. Uh, in this sense, I think it's important to give him a little background on uh, what was going on musically at the time. So, when he's a, a, a teenager, in the early, um, late 40s, early 50s, he starts in school, he comes from a black family living in, in suburbs of Philadelphia. Uh, by the, that time, post-war, uh, it was getting in a crisis moment in the country. Uh, and many black uh, families were moving north from the south, uh, especially to areas like Detroit, Chicago, and Philly, very especially. Bebop was still the, the big thing, but there were also some R&B was starting to grow. So in that sense, Lee comes from a family where almost all siblings were musicians. They, uh, his mom stayed mostly at home, his daddy worked. Uh, back in those days, it was a lot more Things were a little more open, especially in those communities. They would be very organized. People would look after each other. There was this sense of reverence for the elderly, respect. People would really respect each other. So he grew up in this environment, uh, an extremely well-talented kid at school. He was very intelligent. Uh, always had a thing for music. Uh, local trumpet in, in the city. Um, Alan Washington uh, really caught his interest in music uh, and one of his uh, great friends also was a trumpeter. So Lee Morgan, uh, he started with his sister, she would, uh, she would play piano and sing at the church. He would follow her and he was getting to the vibes. But uh, you know, the vibes uh, soon he changed uh, due to influence from his friends on a trumpet and there he started playing. So his sister actually gave him his, his very first instrument. Uh, and it's not worth saying that um, not only um, Lee was there, but in Philly, of K the most obvious examples, Philly Joe Jones, uh, Spanky the Brass was there, Bobby Timmons, Jimmy Merritt, um, McCoy Tyner, many others. And of course, the great Clifford Brown, which uh, actually came to teach, gave some lessons to, to Lee Morgan in his house. Uh, they would play together sometimes. And Lee, uh, it, it was his death at the age of 25 was really, really shook Lee and uh, made him really pursue. And I think this death of Clifford Brown, in a sense, created a vacuum. In a sense that he was supposed to be the next big young thing. And perhaps later, eventually, this role kind of ended up being um, directed to Lee Morgan, that's the expectations people had on him. This upbringing his life was very interesting. Uh, for, for a black kid in those days, even now maybe, right? Um, there was only three ways out of poverty, out of this difficulty. It was academic, sports, or music. Uh, so those people were seen with very regard and respect in the community. Uh, just like nowadays, we had territories marked by gangs who had to, to pay to go or not be allowed and those guys had free traffic. Uh, they would even have their instruments or books carried by, uh, as it happens to, to Spanky for example. So Lee grows in this environment, he keeps practicing, he keeps uh, even like playing gigs of um, you know big bands that come to the city and in 1956 he goes, 1954 sorry, he goes to Bass Bound Technical High School and of course he enrolls in music. 
and he starts, you know, at school he plays mostly uh, classical music, but then he gets a little more, um, a little closer to some other uh, students and some professors, has more like classes, he's still uh, jamming with Clifford Brown, learning from him, and in 1956 he graduates. By those days he was already playing uh, regular gigs, being invited to play from bar mitzvahs, uh, weddings, uh, dances, clubs, even being a minor, um, there was some uh, leeway there to, to accommodate him. A, a lot of people just turned a blind eye and, uh, and let him play at the clubs, even with the being served alcohol, they just playing them, putting them to play at, at the back of the clubs, for example. And that's how he played. He would play a lot with folks like Jimmy, um, Jimmy Merritt, with Bobby Timmons, with Spanky, I mean, everybody. And in 56, he graduates. So by his graduation, he, he was deciding what to do, where to go. And uh, after playing uh, a local gig, uh, Art Blakey had, um, he had Lee join the band and he invites Lee to go to New York, but he doesn't. His family wasn't very attracted to the idea, so they, they said, no, uh, you're not going right now. And, but he still keeps playing locally. And there's even an interesting episode uh, when Sony State is in town, there was a music shop in the city. They would host these people coming and jamming. And, and Lee Morgan from very early had this uh, youngster, cool attitude that uh, was kind of expected and cultivated among these young jazz players and jazz players to look cool, to be cool. Uh, being a musician is my passport to education, to academia, to a, a degree, let's say, because those guys had no access to going to college or university. And even to improve their vocabularies, they would read really thoroughly and carefully like liner notes to, to learn words and speeches and, and things. Uh, which I thought it was quite interesting. So he was always dressed up, you know, with his loose clothes, but always like classy, uh, as most jazz musicians would do. And even the, the, the audience, they were young musicians trying to be musicians. So they, they expected to see those guys look cool, and they had to look cool for, uh, for the girls, for, for the audience, the other musicians. And Lee Morgan, uh, as described, he was a guy that from a very early age, he was a ladies man, he had uh, many girlfriends, but at the same time, he was very focused on music. He wouldn't let anything distract him from music. So one of those episodes, uh, Sonny Stitt was visiting town, he was playing this music shop, and Lee's just sitting there looking from above, and he gets invited to go play. Oh, someone wants to come play with me. And, and Lee was like, okay, I'll go. He gets invited. And Sonny asked him very, you know, what do you want to play? And Lee very um, carelessness said, oh, you pick, I don't care, you can play whatever. And Sonny was known for being kind of merciless on these jam sessions. He, he wouldn't let anybody, you know. So he said, okay, let's play Cherokee in B. And um, Lee tried to try to change the tuning of his instrument. He tries to, you know, change things on the fly, he wasn't prepared for that, and Sonny starts playing and, and really crushes him. And that was a very important episode in his life. Uh, according to to a people, present said he disappeared for the entire summer. Nobody knew him. Nobody knew where he was, what he was doing. So he was pretty much locked in. He was practicing, 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 and by the end of the summer when he returned, he was apparently playing Cherokee in any key, in any way, any speed or anything. So, but back to his life, in 1956, he finally accepts an invitation. After uh, turning down Blake's offer, he goes to New York with Dizzy Gillespie. Dizzy Gillespie invites him to join his big band. And it's hard to say no to that, so his family this time accepted. Uh, so Dizzy wires him the money for a train ticket and gives him one of those inverted trumpets that um, he played in the Blue Train sessions, for example, that he played um, in his uh, of, in the, is in the cover of his very first records, right? So in 1956 he goes to New York, he starts touring with a Dizzy band, he starts to really develop himself as a musician, learning to know start, uh, styles from other musicians. And back then, he, he was already uh, known by Benny Golson. He was friends with Benny Golson. 
Benny Gelson was really really big supporter and he Benny invites him invites uh, Alfred Lyon to go see a session uh, I think it was at the Birdland if I'm not mistaken and Alfred Lyon goes there you know Benny Gelson tried to make Blue Note record uh, those guys and he picks Lee he said no I want this guy to record a record for me uh, so on October 4th if I'm not mistaken um, yeah, October 4th in 1956, Lee Morgan goes to the Blue Note studio and records a session, which will be Blue, um, Lee Morgan indeed. However, the next day he uh, is asked by Hank Mobley to join him in a, in a session. Hank Mobley was recording a record for Savoy. And some of the leftovers from that session that uh, Hank didn't use, they became the very first release record by um, by Lee Morgan, called Introducing Lee Morgan, which was um, released by Savoy. Uh, so this record is kind of controversial in a sense because it was not his very first recording, but it was his very first release. Uh, Lion was not happy. Uh, actually, uh, just a parenthesis here, it's quite an interesting story. So Savoy and Prestige, they were known as labels that they would just put musicians together, record a session release. There's not much polishing thinking about it. Blue Note, unlike them, they would rehearse. Blue Note had a rehearsing space uh, on 89th and Broadway, uptown. They would get the musicians, select them, you know, uh, bring it over there so they can practice rehearse before recording a session. They wanted everything to be really polished and perfected. Uh, for the musicians, there was a great opportunity. They would, they would say, well, why, why would say no? Uh, they gave me the opportunity to, to record and to rehearse and practice. So it, it was a win-win a, a for both sides. So they were also very attentive to the artwork, as we know, and the quality uh, using plastic, light, uh, plastic um, vinyl, right? Uh, always virgin, never recycled. So Blue Note was always very careful on that. But that would take longer, so they were frequently getting scooped by labels like Prestige and Savoy. They would just record, cut the record, and that's it. So that gave origin, that started the whole thing on Blue Note of um, signing ex uh, exclusive deals, uh, record, record deals with, um, with musicians to keep them with the label, keep some fidelity, keep some um, loyalty to the label. So then in 57 we have this first release. Lee Morgan indeed. Uh, along with introducing Lee Morgan, those were good records, uh, but still they show a lot of um, immature musician. He was still, in a sense, developing. He was throwing a lot of notes, a lot of chords, but there wasn't much personality to it. Um, the, the, the supporting players were not the greatest that they could be, and Benny Golson felt that. So starting from there, Benny Golson kind of uh, he godfather in a sense. He said, "Okay, I'm gonna let's take care of your composition, your writing, uh, you know, your playing. Uh, let's get big right musicians to 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 work on their next records." So on for the next three records uh, recorded by Lee, um, Benny Golson was involved. So right before releasing his next Blue Note, he had this very interesting release here on specialty called Dizzy Atmosphere. Because Dizzy uh, is pretty much um, Lee Morgan with members of the Dizzy Gillespie's orchestra. This record is very important in a sense. It's, it's like a tribute um, from Lee to Dizzy. It's like Lee saying thank you. Um, this was a very important uh, moment in my career. You brought me to New York. You make me grow, you make develop, and now I'm kind of uh, growing my own wings and going forward, which uh, I think was very, very nice of him. So he had his next three records with Benny Golson. Volume 2, which unfortunately I don't have, it's on the mail, which is a very hard record to find. I finally grabbed a copy of uh, Volume 2. Then came Volume 3, 1557, which is amazing. One of my favorites. I really like uh, his playing here. The sound of the record overall is really good. And again, has Wynton Kelly, Paul Chambers, Gigi Grice, and Benny Golson. Um, really, really cool. And uh, Gigi and uh, Benny were very important, not only in producing records and as musicians, but they were trying to 
uh, being successful in a sense, but not much of, in publishing rights, in uh, making musicians be more conscious and aware of, it, of their publishing rights, because they're pretty much just giving away everything. They would, they wouldn't make any money. They wouldn't make any penny there. They just play sessions, get paid, burn the money, or whatever, and um, not retain anything, not hold anything. Uh, to Blue Note's uh, merit, I'd say Blue Note was great because although they were retaining money, they were reinvesting in those rehearsals, the production of the record. You know, I think at least Blue Note was, was doing a good job on that part. Then after Volume 3 came City Lights, which also is a fantastic record. Um, this has this kind of feeling of the young kid coming to town, he's holding a magazine, kind of mesmerized with the city lights, the bars, the clubs, um, the movies, the sound, the this mesmerizing colors. It is also a great record and his last one arranged and produced by Benny Golson. Really, really good. Here he starts developing the more industry. He kind of grows, um, kind of starts developing a character. And then he uh, has two more records. So these are his first four. In his first year of Blue Note, he recorded six records. Next coming Candy. And his next one, also in 57, uh, this milestone here, the cooker. I think the cooker has the combination of uh, his style. He really polishes. He's not only playing chords and notes, but he's giving his personality. He's adding something to it in a, in a manner that uh, is very personal. It's, it's Lee's style. I think this is a statement uh, to his style here. And here he plays, you know, some Dizzy, Mel in Tunisia, uh, just one of those things, Numa, Heavy Deeper. It is a great record. I mean, it's one of, I think it's one of the favorite tone poets out there. I have the tone poet, but this is my RVG cut, which sounds incredible as well. And it's very dear. Um, so, and he has one more that comes out. A couple more records that come out by those times. Um, it is a little different with Jackie McLean and Bob Timmons, Paul Chambers and Eric Blakey. That's Lee Wei, which is also an amazing session. Lee Wei is... It's a really good record. It was like um, an extra, an extra gig that he played out of the contract, uh, which we're going to get into more into those things about playing out of contract and shelf records, uh, which I think is, is very important to be aware of. So the way it comes out, and um, then he has his contract ended. He decides to in '58 he applies for Juilliard. He's accepted in Juilliard, of course, but he doesn't go to Juilliard because he gets an invitation, he gets invited, he goes jazz, he goes uh, join the Jazz Messengers, of course, by Eric Blakey. Uh, by those days, the, the Jazz Messengers, they were being kind of reformulated by Benny Golson. So Benny brings all those guys from Philadelphia, he brings Lee Morgan, he brings uh, Bobby Timmons, he brings Jimmy Merritt, uh, they try, um, Jack McLean quits quickly, then uh, Hank Mobley comes and quits as well, he was not, um, high too often, he was not a reliable player, they, they kick him out. Uh, they even play some gigs without the saxophone. Uh, so Benny Golson uh, fills in, he plays for some time with the, for some time with the Messengers. Um, then in a tour in Canada, when they're playing in Canada, um, so Lee Morgan meets um, a, a, an old friend, uh, Wayne Shorter, who was, um, just, was still with a band, but he gives, uh, he gives notice and um, within two weeks later he joins the Jazz Messengers for which will be a very, very important and um, I want to say long live, but uh, it was one of the, the, the most important um, Jazz Messengers uh, lineups, formations. Um, out of his contract, uh, out of his uh, own uh, sessions, he records this record with uh, Lee Morgan with um, Hank Mobley, which is Amazing back in time, really, really good. So just going back to the messengers now. The messenger is an interesting um, phase for Lee. He is with the messengers from '58 to '61, and of course we all know the the, the, the records that he cut with them. They're just like masterpieces, amazing stuff. 
uh, not to mention his side work that's playing for let's say Blue Train, right? Which is I found I just noticed the other day. Blue Train is 1577 and the cooker is 1578, which I thought was super cool. Anyways, so in 58 he joins the Just Messengers. And the Just Messenger is like a school. He was like, I'm not going to Juilliard, but I'm going to a different type of school. And playing with the Messengers has been uh, like this uh, for a long time. Our Blake, he was already an old school guy, in a sense. Uh, and he had this thing about bringing young musicians, uh, like Dizzy, in a sense. Like, bring musicians, giving them space, teaching them something um, all the time. Uh, he was known, he had a very heavy hand, right? So uh, he was always keeping his players on the edge. He was always keeping them on the edge. Um, like the horn player, especially Ian Wayne, they would always say, he was always like increasing, increasing the rhythm, playing louder or, or just shouting from the, from the kit, like go, go for it, do it, play, play, play. Even the piano, um, Bobby Timmons uh, used to say that, uh, he, after he started playing with uh, with um, art, he had to kind of reach and play keys that he never even thought about it because he had to go there, he had to be fast, he had to do something extra. And so for the horns too, they always had to play louder or faster or slower but more intense. That brought a lot of intensity to their playing, which which was something. So Lee and Wayne, they started playing together. They had a, a, a good run there with the, with the, messenger, with the messengers. This was uh, Lee's first record with the Messengers, the Big Beat. And then of course came the, one, of the, one of the biggest ones, Night in Tunisia, which is a really well-known piece for, for a guy like me. And when short the Bobby Tim was Jimmy Merritt, I Blakey, that's, that's the thing, right? That's a great record and um, that's very important to Lee's journey. And they could be a little different too. That's a, a really, a really good recording by the Jazz Messengers. Um, one of the greatest live recordings. And of course, there many other recordings. There were there were these later in the '60s, like "Free for All," um, you know, uh, "Witch Doctor," and even this one here, "Roots and Herbs." I picked this one because I think it's very important. Uh, about the playing. So Lee and Wayne, uh, in a sense, they would like practice a lot together, they would exchange uh, things. So if Lee, in a sense, like to, to do this long, more um, powerful tones, and uh, um, Wayne, uh, according to his own report, he would be more fragmented, more experimental out there. So they were kind of pushing each other into each other's direction. Um, Lee trying to incorporate uh, elements of Wayne in his play and Wayne incorporating Lee. So you can feel that really well. And Roots and Herbs is the culmination of this process. It's a quite interesting if you go uh, listen to Mastermind, the last track on the record. I think it, it, it's, it's quite interesting and clear how you see they're playing each other's style. They kind of, and this really culmination of this process. They are really, really sharp and playing along very well. Um, however, this uh, brought some disadvantages and dissatisfactions. So, um, Wayne Shorter leaves the Jazz Messengers to join, of course, Miles Quintet. Uh, because he felt limited in a sense. He had, I always have to play in a certain way, certain tones, things don't change much, it gets monotonous. He wanted to open, explore, and develop his composer side, which uh, is very clear that um, he, was, he was very right in doing that, just listen to the Miles. Um, 60s records, uh, Wayne Shore, their production, like like Night Dreamer, for example, which is a, an amazing, amazing record. And, and then Lee, uh, also lived in 61. So about our Blake, a couple of things. He wasn't the great, greatest drummers ever. Uh, he was a, a really big school for musicians, but he had his uh, drawbacks as well. Uh, interestingly, from what I've been reading, from what I've been studying, um, he was not known as being a good payer. Uh, musicians would not, um, some musicians would refuse to work with him because the pay was very low. And regarding the drug use, there are many uh, reports, many accounts, uh, musicians, uh, people in the industry, 
talking about drug use and uh, in, in certain cases some musicians say they were trying to even force to use drugs by Eric Blake who was a junkie himself. Um, that being said, the, the reason was many uh, just like to try to keep them awake because they were also exploited. These folks, they had to play like long, long, long nights for like very low pay. So they had to keep playing. So they would try to stay awake or look cool or, or do anything. But what art would do in many cities when they were like touring, they were not in New York, uh, it was hard. They had no dealer and they had to buy stuff. And Art Blakey knew everybody. So he would supply stuff to the musicians and then get this cut this out of their pay later. So people would pretty much just play for free, <laughs> you know? And that, that was very frustrating for, for many musicians, many, many. And, um, and many said that they were tried, they were kind of induced to, to, the, to the addiction by art. But still, I mean, these are reports, these are uh, accounts by, by musicians, by people in the industry. Um, you know, it's in many books about it you can read. Um, but anyways, so moving forward, so that kind of compromised Lee because Lee got addicted, um, especially to heroin. And in 61, he quits the, the Messengers. And then he goes play um, some, some sessions for VJ back on the West Coast. So VJ was a label that was started uh, trying to bring this East Coast vibe to the West Coast jazz. But resources were limited, so VJ um, hires uh, mostly, um, not leaders, they hire uh, support musicians that, in the bands like Lee Morgan, uh, Bobby Timmons, Jimmy Merritt, um, Wayne Shorter. They recorded a lot for VJ back in those days. But because they were sidemen, so their contracts were much cheaper than hiring like big names. And Lee stays with VJ. He is, in, uh, you know, right? Uh, Young Lion, um, Wayne Short has his records there. Some interesting production, not the 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 the, the highest uh, end for for these guys. But still, in '63, he kind of returns to Blue Note. Um, to to have another contract and play as a leader, and then uh, things change a little bit. But uh, I think this first episode was just kind of talking about more his upbringing, some of his early work for Blue Note, because he has so many records, even I get confused. So I think it was very good to, to put things in perspective, to understand a little more where things came, where they're going to, and how the process went. So on episode two, we're going to talk about more of this comeback to Blue Note, um, the height of his career, another decline. And on episode three, we're going to wrap up the end of his life. That is a very uh, run of production and some other aspects like that. Okay, thank you so much for watching. I hope you liked this video. I enjoyed a lot making it. Please like and subscribe to the Jazz Bombs. We're gonna have an episode coming out soon as well. Okay, thank you so very much. You have a good one.